uh, it was in a variety of topics, uh, DSM topics, both Collider and Dark Matter Recognition. Today he's going to tell us about in Elastic Series Scatter. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's lovely to be here. Uh, first, before I start into the physics, I want to make an apology for anybody who's in the wrong seminar. I noticed as I came in today that I have been given a, a new title. So I, I'm not even sure I can spell PMT. So, um, so anybody, oh, yeah. thinks, anybody who thinks I'm an experimentalist is going to be disappointed. Uh, although this talk will have a large connection to experiments, but uh, just give it, getting my uh, apologies in first. OK, so here's the outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to be taking two approaches to looking for a particular class of dark matter models, the inelastic dark matter models. I'll explain what that means in a minute. Uh, these two approaches basically require, in one case, going to high energies, and in one case, going to low energies. So we'll take the high jump approach and the limbo approach to looking for a dark matter. So the outline of the talk is basically that uh, we'll give you a brief reminder of where we are in the world of dark matter, what we know and what we don't know. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the spectrum of models that are out there, the wind and uh, beyond the wind, and then I'll focus in on one particular example, which is inelastic dark matter. Uh, I'll lead you through uh, what's different in elastic dark matter than the sort of canonical elastic dark matter, in particular the kinematics of the various of the equations changes and that has implications for experiments. I'll take a short aside because I am a theorist and I have to into model land. I'll try to make it brief. Um, and then I will talk, as I said, about the high jump approach and the limbo approach for looking for these uh, elastic models. Okay, so here in one transparency is everything we sort of know to date about dark matter. Uh, this is information gathered at various scales and at various times in uh, the universe's history. You know, we have uh, measurements of uh, um, uh, light element abundances from BGN, and uh, we can predict these based on the amount of uh, baryonic and, and dark matter and number of photons and things like this in the other universe. We have rotation curves of galaxies like our own, in particular our own, and galaxies like our own. Uh, they, they don't make sense unless you put additional material that we can't see inside the galaxies. Uh, we've measured uh, the universe at the sort of largest scale, the CMD scale, and these uh, temperature fluctuations that we see on the sky don't make sense unless there is a uh, large fraction of the matter that is out there is not charged under the standard model. And we've seen clusters of galaxies crash into each other and do strange things. And again, we can't explain these unless uh, there is some amount of dark matter out there. So the bottom line of these various observations at various times and on various scales, as I said, is that we come up with this wonderful uh, pie chart of what makes up our universe at large. The stuff that you and I are made of makes up about 5% of the matter energy budget of the universe. There's this large, unknown, weird stuff that I'm not going to talk about. And then the, the uh, the rest of this talk will be about this 27% or so of uh, the matter energy budget that is in this form of dark matter. And it goes into explaining some of these observables. So uh, to make a very long story very short, uh, the bottom line is, as I said, the dark matter makes up about 27% of the matter energy budget of the universe. It seems to pull stuff towards it just like you and I do. Uh, um, so it behaves under gravity like ordinary matter. But it is not one. Uh, it's not. A, it's not baryonic. It's not one of the particles in the standard model. Uh, it appears to be uh, very neutral under the standard model. It also doesn't appear to interact very much with itself. Although much here is, uh, you know, is, what I mean by much is that it has sort of uh, at most uh, nuclear-sized cross sections with itself. Um, it doesn't appear to couple to a massless particle. It was cold at the time of the CMB to explain these temperature fluctuations and it's uh, long lived on cosmological time scales. And the bottom line, if you add all these things up together, is you, and you go through the list of known particles, you find that there's no such particle that has all these properties in the standard model. So dark matter is sort of a, a, a hint of BSM physics. It's a piece of BSM physics that we have to try to understand. OK, so um, one thing that may concern you a little bit about the collection of facts I just presented very, very rapidly was that all the probes of dark matter that were mentioned there were gravitational in nature. Right? They were all coming back to um, how stars in the outer reaches of galaxies move under the gravitational, the gravitational attraction of the stars interior to their orbit, um, how uh, density fluctuations grow in the early universe, and so on and so forth. So all these probes are revol uh, revolving around the gravitational interactions of dark matter. 
And very few of them actually probe uh, non gravitational interactions. So that might give you cause for concern until you go back to the history books and you remind yourself that uh, um, in the history of, of, of science, there have been many discoveries that were first made through uh, gravitational interactions. So in fact, the first discovery of, of dark matter, uh, if you like that, uh, to think of it that way, was uh, the discovery of Neptune. So the discovery of Neptune is a, is a great story because they looked at the, the motions of the orbits of the outer planets and they saw that they didn't make sense. And somebody sat down with a large piece of paper and calculated how to make the wobbles in Uranus make sense and they said, well, there has to be another planet out there somewhere. In fact, the calculation was so good that they were able to make predictions as to where this planet was, and it took about an hour or so of observing time, once they looked in the right patch of the sky, to see Neptune. So it just goes to show you that theorists are good for something, right? We can calculate well, and we can calculate the right thing at the right time, and make a definitive prediction, and it even comes true. So um, that was the discovery of the uh, original piece of dark matter. And then, of course, there have been other anomalies in uh, gravity's behavior that have led to far-reaching discoveries. So um, the behavior of Mercury, one of the inner planets, or the innermost planet, is that right? Yes, the innermost planet, um, didn't behave properly. The orbit wasn't seemed to make sense. And in fact, our, our go-to move was to invent another planet. In this case, it was Spock's birthplace, um, to explain uh, why the perihelion of Mercury didn't behave the way it should. Uh, and uh, that didn't work in that case. It actually required a far greater explanation, which was uh, general relativity, to explain why Mercury did it. But again, these are two examples of new physics showing up first through gravitational interactions. So, uh, um, so there's no reason to be concerned that the only way we've seen dark matter so far is through gravitational interactions. But it does lead to an obvious question about what about its other interactions? Is there anything we can say about the other interactions of dark matter? So. There are many types of interactions you could imagine. Oh, this didn't show up so well. Uh, never mind, I think it's better on the next one's um, There are many types of uh, interactions you could imagine dark matter having, depending on how you think it interacts with, with uh, various components of the standard model. If it interacts with leptons or gauge bosons or, or uh, hadronic matter, that leads to various uh, predictions for processes one could look for. And even if dark matter only interacts with itself, there are still predictions for new processes beyond gravitational interactions that we can go uh, and search for. So this is an ongoing effort across the field, right, to look for, uh, so for instance, pick one of the paths through this complicated diagram. Imagine the dark matter interacts with quarks and gluons. Well, that has the prediction then that there are quarks, of gluons, quarks and gluons inside uh, patterns, inside nuclei. And so if dark matter interacts with quarks and gluons, and therefore will interact with nuclei, which means that if we get enough nuclei in one place at one time and watch them for long enough, we should see dark matter scatter off them and make nuclei suddenly start moving for no good reason. So that's direct, the direct detection way of looking at dark matter. Similarly, if there are interactions with uh, the quarks and gluons, then there are processes whereby dark matter can annihilate against itself and produce pairs of quarks or gluons in the final state. So we could look for these types of processes to happen in uh, our galaxy or in uh, dwarf galaxies orbiting our galaxy. So if we look for places where there's an overabundance of dark matter, we might be able to see the indications of this annihilation going on. Alternatively, we can rotate this diagram the third way, and we can look for uh, uh, dark matter being produced through quarks and gluons crashing into each other, and that's an ongoing, uh, ongoing uh, uh, industry at the LHC, right, to look for dark matter production. The LHC. And finally, if dark matter doesn't talk to anything by itself, there are still implications because when dark matter interacts, there are places in galaxies where there's a large amount of dark matter, and if it has interactions with itself beyond gravitational interactions, that will change the way dark matter is distributed in the interior of galaxies or in clusters of galaxies. And we can start to try to see the effects of these uh, self interactions in the distribution of dark matter. So these are all ways you could try to probe non-gravitational interactions. Um, is there any reason to believe that there might be non-gravitational interactions? There's this very famous story that I'm sure you're all familiar with if you've ever opened up Colton Turner, where this plot is stolen from. Um, there's this story about how uh, the weak shall inherit the universe. Um, basically, if you imagine that there are interactions amongst dark matter particles with the standard model, so a process like this could occur, where dark matter can annihilate into standard model fermions, or standard model fermions can annihilate into dark matter, then if you go back early enough in the universe where everything is very, very hot, this forwards and backwards process is in equilibrium, 
and you would end up with a thermal distribution of uh, dark matter. And then as the universe cools and the temperatures start to drop, eventually one direction of this process will turn off. So let's imagine a world in which the dark matter is heavier than the standard model fermions. Then at some point when the temperature drops below the dark matter mass, the only part of this interaction that can really occur is the annihilation of dark matter. The other direction, uh, the incoming fermions do no longer have enough energy to create dark matter because they're co cold in air. And eventually this process so-called freezes out and uh, you're, if you track over time, so this is a, the x-axis here is a surrogate for time, so time gets uh, later as you move to the right. And what's plotted on the y-axis is the abundance of dark matter. And you all know this story, that for a while uh, dark matter remains in equilibrium, and then at some point this reaction freezes out and the process can no longer occur, and you're left basically uh, with the amount of dark matter you had at that moment. No more can, no more can uh, annihilate away because the expansion of the universe is too fast for this uh, process to carry on anymore. And, you're, and the, uh, the amount of dark matter stops changing, or in these units, I should have said, in the co-moving units. So the amount of dark matter uh, per co-moving volume stops changing. And we're left with a certain amount of dark matter. And uh, all that you need to do to carry out this, all you need to know to carry out this calculation is the expansion rate of the universe, which we approximately know, and how fast this process happens. And what you find amazingly is that if you put in a, a sort of a, a canonical cross-section of, of something of the weak scale into this calculation, into this uh, Boltzmann calculation, the amount of dark matter you end up with is approximately the amount of dark matter you observe. So if the additional interactions dark matter had were weak scale in size, you would end up just through the thermal evolution of the universe, you would end up with approximately the right amount of dark matter to satisfy that pie chart that they started. So, so there is a, a, a nice story, which may or may not be true, but it's a nice story either way, um, that uh, uh, gives us hope that dark matter may have more than gravitational interactions. Okay, so let's imagine it does have more than gravitational interactions. Then I told you there were those four towers of search strategy. So let's zoom in on one of those search strategies. So I'm going to focus from now on on bear protection. So this is, again, this, the idea that you uh, take a lump of standard model stuff, somewhere very, very quiet, typically deep underground where there's uh, no cosmic rays and hopefully you've got all the radioactivity out of your lab. And you sit and you look at that standard model stuff and you wait for it to move in an unexplained way. And, and if it does, then you can explain that by dark matter scattering against it. So we've been doing these experiments for a while now. And here is uh, some version of um, uh, the latest story. This may be months out of date, but it gets the message across nonetheless. Um, that, uh, so the way these results are usually plotted is here on the x-axis is the mass, putative mass of the dark matter, and here on the y-axis is the size of the scattering cross-section of uh, the dark matter of a neutron. Okay, and uh, these curves are uh, um, the band as set by various experiments. So the region above these curves are ruled out. Um, and what you see is we've been doing very, very well, uh, right? So these bands uh, are getting down to very open, sorry. So if, if, if you go back to the previous transparency uh, where I told you that if it had weak scale interactions, you could get the right relic abundance, where would a weak scale interaction lie on this plot? Well, couplings through uh, Z boson exchange have a scattering cross-section of about 10 to the minus 37, 38 centimeters squared. So that's where a Z boson exchange of dark matter with a nucleon in this plot, right? And you see that we've long since crossed this threshold, and now these direct detection experiments are moving down, the bands are all the way down here, and if you were to ask uh, what other weak bosons are out there that could give weak size cross-sections, well, there's an obvious candidate, the Higgs, and so you could ask where on this plot would the scattering cross-section uh, through Higgs exchange lie? And I've drawn it as a thicker line because it's harder to make a definitive prediction. You need to, it's more model dependent now. But it's somewhere in or below this ballpark number, right, which I've done very badly, but it's about 10 to the minus 44 centimeters squared or thereabouts. So you see that these direct detection experiments are now, in some cases, starting to rule out some of these models where the dark matter would talk to us through Higgs exchange. Um, uh, so, so these experiments have been doing very, very well. And then I should point out that this uh, yellow floor here is thanks to Louis, you're sitting over there. Uh, and this is sort of the, as far as we can imagine going uh, with the present technology, this is where you hit a point 
where there is an irreducible background. So below this yellow, the shallow, yellow shaded region, um, neutrino processes. Uh, so these are, these are uh, um, atmospheric neutrinos and, and um, uh, diffuse background from signal and things like that. The rate at which those neutrinos scatter off nuclei is now large enough to fake it up and signal down here. So this is the so-called neutrino. So you see the direct detection experiments are doing a great job, right? Uh, of uh, eating into the uh, dark matter parameter space. Um, any questions? No? Just a stretch? Okay. Um, so, so this has led the field to, to, to worry a little bit, right? Because uh, we used to start up here, and uh, the neutrino floor was way down here, and so there was lots of room for discovery. Now the, the bounds of the present experiments are here, and these dashed curves, I should have said, uh, are proposed iter uh, future iterations of these experiments and how far they expect to reach, uh, how, where they expect to be able to place a bound if they don't see any events. Uh, and we're getting marching closer and closer to the neutrino floor. Um, and so this has led to a growth in the number of types of models one can, is allowed to imagine from moving away from the canonical WIMP story from the basic WIMP into a whole host of different models. Um, with, so here, I, I've suppressed the, the cross-section scale for now. This is just a mass scale. This is to show you how uh, the field has, uh, the playing field has enlarged as the physics field has uh, got more imaginative over time. So this is the WIMP story here that I, I was talking about. And the WIMP is limited uh, to lie in this rather small mass range from about the GeV up to tens of TeV. Um, but we now, we now have uh, models written down in various papers uh, which elongate this mass scale immensely. And you now see that there are potential dark matter candidates that span uh, many, many more orders of magnitude of uh, mass range. Yeah. And so this is taken from some large community uh, effort paper. But you see the, the WIMP story that we used to know and love. And now if you uh, change the mediator the dark matter talks to the standard model with from just being electroweak gauge bosons to being some new gauge bosons, then you can evade the Lee Weinberg band and you can elongate the mass scale. And now you can imagine uh, mass is all the way down to KV scale or so. There are various other scenarios which also allow you to uh, elongate the mass scale. There's the potential idea that uh, primordial black holes, however they may be created, could be the dark matter. And then there are all these uh, very, very light dark matter dark matter is not on the fermionic, but has to be bosonic. Uh, the axion, the QCD axion has various cousins. What's the elder? What's an elder? What's an elder? elder. So uh, and that's elastically decoupling relic. Uh -huh. So it's a, it's, it's, yeah, it sits here next to SIMS because you can imagine there's a parameter, basically the three to two versus the two to two annihilation process. Oh, okay. And depending on whether, which one dominates, you're either in the SIMP land, which is when three to two has cannibalization wins, or the two to two process is winning. But in both cases, there are both processes turned on. Okay. We can go through the details of those. Okay. It's a tuned model. Is that a relatively new acronym? I'm just like. Oh, uh, yeah, it's in the last couple of years. Okay. Yeah. And I, I, now I'm really worried about the second E. It might be one of these. Well, what, either one I've ever heard of it. Elastically so. decoupled in the new okay. But, uh, okay. So, so what many of these models do, you see, you notice that the WIMP was cut off at GV or thereabouts. I guess I've done a few GV in this picture. Um, and what a lot of these new models do is try to, uh, to elongate the mass range for the dark matter candidate. And the reason they try to do this is because they look at this plot and they see, well, there isn't much real estate between the present bands and the neutrino floor, but there's a lot of real estate over here because the bands sort of turn off because of threshold effects in these experiments. It's very hard for them to see very light dark matter. So if you actually, uh, you see there's a lot of white space in this plot down here at low mass. Right? There's a lot of real estate down there, and those models try to take advantage of that. So it basically elongates the x-axis as a way of, um, of uh, uh, this is what's called the low mass dark matter frontier. OK, um, yeah, I guess. I don't want to go through this. We can talk more about elders, but it's to do with this process here. Um, so let's see. So what I want to do, so this is the low mass frontier, right, which is to try to evade uh, the shrinking of the white space here and go into these uh, into this low mass region. So you can build models to do that, and there are many models that have been written down. 
The question is, can you test them? And what this plot is hoping to show is that uh, just as theorists are getting creative to avoid experimental constraints, experimentalists are getting creative to close uh, the region that the theorists are marching into. And there are a whole bunch of, this plot is way too busy to contain any useful information. Uh, that's not the point. The point is just to show you that there are many lines on this plot, right? And, and that, that shows you people are working. And what you should notice about these lines is if you were to try to find amongst here an existing band, they would all stop at about uh, 10 GeV or so. And what these lines are doing is slowly but surely marching to lower and lower masses. And then these dashed green lines, which are the even more speculative ideas from the experimental community, are marching even further into the lower mass frontier. So the point I'm trying to capture maybe this plot says it in a more digestible form than the, than the previous plot, is just as theorists have got creative to create alternative models to WIMPs, experimentalists have got creative to, to invent alternative technologies to probe those alternative models. And, and, uh, and uh, it's a very exciting time because there's this healthy back and forth between the theory and the experimental community, right? Oh, you've got a good idea, oh, I've got a great idea to rule out your good idea. And so there's this uh, healthy competition. And then these things in red, are various anomalies that may or may not be true and that are also motivating us to think in these regards. Okay, so all that was uh, sort of a far too long introduction to try to lay the groundwork of where we are at the moment, right? We, are, we have these amazing direct detection experiments that are starting to, to shrink the available space. People are exploring the low mass frontier. And what I want to do is I want to, um, so there's these two frontiers. You could just try to get ahead of the experimental constraints by dialing down the coupling. That's what means good going from the Z to the X here is making that coupling smaller. Uh, so you can go through the low coupling frontier. You can go into the low mass frontier to avoid these constraints. But what I want to do is think in an entirely orthogonal direction and go into the, the small splitting frontier. Okay, so now I've uh, taken this plot and laid it on the plane, and, and I'm now pointing out there's a suppressed direction uh, in these plots, which is um, to go. Uh, so what, you, what you're usually thinking about for direct detection is some what we call an elastic scattering, right? So this is the process uh, written in effective field theory language. There's some incoming dark matter particle scattered on some standard model particle. I'm not telling you how that happens, but there's some effective operator. And then what comes out of the interaction is the dark matter of the standard model particle. So it's an elastic two to two scattering. What I want to do to move in this orthogonal direction is to change slightly the process that goes on here and make the outgoing dark matter particle different from the incoming dark matter. So now it'll be an inelastic scatter. And you could imagine that, the, and this delta is denoting a mass splitting between the outgoing particle and the ingoing particle. And you'll notice that I've drawn the axis only pointing in the positive direction. That was deliberate because as far as this talk's concerned, I only want to think about this state being heavier than this state. But both possibilities are, are uh, you know, logically possible. Uh, the, the endothermic case is what I'll refer to as inelastic dark matter. And the exothermic case, where this is lighter than this one, uh, I won't consider this talk. But I'm happy to talk about it. So these are not new ideas. I mean, inelastic dark matter was written down uh, a long time ago by David Tucker Smith and Neil Weiner. And the exothermic case was written down uh, many years ago by these characters. Um, but as I said, I'm going to focus on inelastic dark matter, the mass splitting frontier. So what does, um, oh, and uh, for those of you old enough to remember, uh, you know that the reason this was originally written down was to try to explain Dharma, right? So uh, one way of explaining the fact that Dharma uh, claims to see a modulation signal in a region of parameter space ruled out by all the other experiments is to say that uh, the dark matter is inelastic. And that worked back when David and Neil uh, originally wrote down the model. But now the, the experimental story has changed sufficiently that it's very hard to make inelastic dark matter work. So even if you imagine impure, which is this crazy idea that, that dark matter only couples to thallium, which is a tiny component of, of dharma and nothing else, uh, it's almost impossible to make this. I thought you meant like impure in the other sense. Like no, 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 no. This is, <laughs> this is technically <laughs> impure. Like technically impure. <laughs> <impure. laughs> this, yeah, this is the technical definition of impure, <laughs> uh, which was to say that uh, um, thallium turns out to be uh, part per mil or part per so that still works apparently. Here. Uh, it doesn't really work. Okay. But thallium is super heavy. So the idea was, as we'll see in a moment, inelastic dark matter favors heavy targets, and thallium is super heavy. Uh, but it's not sufficiently heavy to overcome the fact that we have a ton of xenon in another experiment that doesn't see anything. Um, 
Okay, so, so uh, here is uh, the golden formula. So if you want to calculate, if you, um, if you have a model and you want to calculate what is the rate for direct detection in, in any experiment, you just need to calculate this integral. So let me explain what the, <coughs> excuse me, let me explain what the moving parts here are. It's very simple. The whole rate scales with the number of things that are in your detector and with the number density of dark matter, so rho over mass is the number density. There's some kinematic factors. There's a form factor to take into account the fact that you're scattering off a nucleus and not a fundamental particle. You have some sc scattering cross-section, which is the thing we're ultimately going to band. And then you have to take into account the fact that dark matter is moving relative to the Earth in some, uh, it's got some average speed and there's some distribution for all the velocities of dark matter. So you need to integrate over that velocity distribution uh, and, uh, and then you need to integrate from some speed, which we'll talk about in a second, to the maximal speed of dark matter in the galaxy, which is the escape velocity of the galaxy, which is a few hundred kilometers, uh, maybe five or six hundred kilometers a second. So you just carry out this integral, you integrate over this distribution, um, and it will tell you the rate. So what changes when I go from the case with no prime to the case with a prime? Right? All that changes is the minimum speed necessary to scatter changes. So you, you can see this just thinking of classical, and this is all classical kinematics, uh, uh, non-relativistic kinematics. Um, if these were the same mass, right, uh, uh, you, could, um, you could scatter almost at any speed. And then the only question would be, does the standard model particle recoil by enough for you to observe it? So the minimum speed would be set by the threshold of the experiment. Right? Because at any speed, this process can take place. Just as you lower the speed, the recall here gets lower and lower, and at some point, the experiment can't see it. But when you put in a mass splitting, the, 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 these, this guy has to come in with enough extra energy, has to come in with enough kinetic energy that it's capable of doing the upscatter. Because this, the rest mass of this is now larger than the rest mass of that. So there's now the minimum speed is no longer set by the threshold of the experiment, but is set by the particle physics parameters. And so that's what this expression is telling you. The, the minimum speed uh, goes up as, uh, as you include a mass speed. So uh, put another way, you can ask, uh, for an incoming dark matter particular speed, what is the observed recoil energy? So how much would the nucleus move by? Uh, for Here I, I fix dark matter to be a TV, and I'm scattering off xenon just to fix all the other parameters. And you see that there's different distribution, oops, different distribution for different splitting. So here is the case of elastic dark matter. And as, as we just said, <coughs> excuse me, as the speed gets lower and lower, lower so, does the, so does the recoil energy. And at some point, your experimentalist will say, hey, I can't see below 5 kV. So you better only look at events above 5 kV, and that puts a minimum speed for that, or whatever that number is. But you see there's a difference when you put a non-zero splitting in, right? That, that eventually, there is no way to get, so, so um, oops, there's no way to, uh, to get very, very low recoil energies from various splittings, just because of just because of this splitting effect, right? To, to get both the highest and lowest recoil energies, you need to go out to largest speeds. And remember, I said there is a maximal speed for dark matter. It's somewhere up here, between say six and eight hundred kilometers a second. So if this splitting is large enough, let's say it's three hundred kV, you're not going to see any events in your detector below fifty kV. You will see events above fifty kV, but you won't see any below. So now that it gets a gap in your spectrum. And in fact, uh, the spectrum gets peaked because of the shape of the maximum Wolfson distribution. Anyway, so here's the, the same diagram again. Uh, I probably shouldn't, since I'm apparently taking it far longer than I expected, shouldn't belabor the point too much. Uh, but uh, there's base, the point is that for inelastic dark matter, there is this gap where you don't expect to see any uh, energy deposited just because of the kinematics. And that both the highest and lowest um, uh, the highest speeds, sorry, lead to both the highest and lowest recoil energies. And then the thing you should remember is that this distribution that dark matter speeds lies on is typically assumed to be something Maxwell Boltzmann like. Uh, we can quibble about the exact details, but I think we would all agree that the distribution of speeds goes up, peaks, and goes back down again. Uh, exactly how it looks in the tails is open for debate still. Um, but it, it roughly has this distribution, and then from the Earth's perspective, because we're moving around the sun, and so our average speed through the dark matter halo changes a little bit from summer to winter, then the observed uh, speed of dark matter in our frame changes slightly from summer here in red to winter. So the average speed goes up slightly in the summer. 
Uh, so one effect of requiring to get a to, to get an event, you need to start moving out to these high speeds. So that means you need to move out to the high speed tail of this distribution, and that's when uh, the difference between summer and winter becomes larger. So these inelastic uh, models typically predict larger modulation fractions than elastic models, and that was part of the historical motivation because Dharma looks for modulation and claims to see something, and so that was one way of explaining it, it was to build a model where the modulation was enhanced. Does that all make sense? So the bottom line um, is that if you put this mass splitting in, if you go into the inelastic frontier, um, you require a larger momentum exchange to scatter. You require this larger EB coil, which as we said, favors the high speed tail of the max of Volstrom distribution. It increases the amount of modulation. Uh, it prefers actually heavier targets. If you go back and look at these expressions about what speed, the lowest possible speed for which you could have a scatter and ask yourself how it scales with target mass. Uh, so the target mass is all embedded in this reduced mass. You'll see that um, for dark matter heavier than the target, the, the heavier you make the target, the lower this speed becomes. And so you get to see more and more of this distribution. So this apex moves down, so you get to see more of the maximum Boltzmann distribution. So inelastic dark matter prefers to scatter off heavier things. You know, it's just kinematics. You have to do this upscatter, so you want to exchange as much momentum as possible. You want to be as close to the hard wall limit as possible. As a result of this gap, the recoil spectrum now has a peak, and sensitivity is increased by going to the largest recoil energy. Okay, so what happens if you go to large recoil energies? Well, um, this is not the way these experiments were originally intended to be run, right? The, the, the race for all of these direct detection experiments was who could lower their threshold as low as possible, because for elastic models, that maximizes your rate, because there was no gap. So the lowest you could go in recoil meant the lowest you could go in speed, which meant the most of the distribution you were sensitive to, so the highest rate you would expect to get. So they've all been pushing to go as low as they could in the weak order, in, in, as low as possible on the x-axis. And now we're saying these inelastic models is actually a reason to want to go the other way. One of the things that happens is this form factor has a bunch of, uh, has this unfortunate feature, as form factors always do, that they get smaller as you go to larger exchange momentum. And uh, you see, I don't know why I've plotted this twice. Oh, for different dark masses. Um, uh, but, but the point is just that this, this form factor is dropping, and here you see these zeros that probably aren't really there, but the, the form factor is at least dropping as you move out to higher recoil energies. So one of the downsides of moving to higher recoil energies is that uh, uh, you suppress the rate. And what I've shown here is, is the, um, what you would expect for the rate in the solid line is with zero, zero mass splitting, and then these uh, subsequent lines are of the various amounts of mass splitting. And you see exactly the gap I told you about, right? That, uh, what is this? For 200 keV, you have no events below about 50 keV, uh, uh, we call it energy. And this dashed gray line is unfortunately the upper threshold of the xenon analysis region. So xenon, uh, when they first produced their results, only looked for weak oil energies between this dashed line and zero, because that's what zero's been telling them for years. And unfortunately, in these inelastic models, they will be insensitive to uh, large splittings. And so that, this is another way of saying the same thing. If you go and open a paper, a Lux, a Xenon, a uh, Crest, uh, uh, Super CDMS, all those things, you'll see similar types of plots with different observables on the X and Y axes, but these are proxies for energy. And what you'll see, so here let's focus on Lux, for example, is they looked at all the recall events, uh, and anything in red here is a nuclear, re anything in this red region is likely to be a nuclear recoil, which is potential dark matter signal. Anything in this blue region is an electron type recoil, and therefore is probably a background. And so what they look for is they look for events below this solid red line, so they have very good separation between the nuclear and electron recoils. And uh, they said we want to look from our threshold up to 30 uh, photo electrons. And so there's some conversion factor converting this to energy, it's about 50 kV. And they, they have data above that, but they said, oh, we're not interested in that because that's not where dark matter would show up, so we're not going to bother to look there. Uh, and so in fact, if you go and look across all experiments, uh, you see that they often impose by hand an upper uh, energy threshold. 
Like the only experiment that doesn't is Peter. So, uh, but that is not as to say they can't look at higher energy. So here is a plot of uh, energy deposited in the detector and rate at xenon 100 going from zero all the way out to 3 MeV. This is the black dot for data, and the red curve is some uh, Monte Carlo they have for all the possible backgrounds that could be contributing. And you see various nuclear lines from bananas and other things are uh, contaminated. Um, but that's, that's just that, uh, uh, the sterile thing as well, so it's bananas all over the place. Yes, bananas everywhere. Yes. <laughs> um, so, anyway, so they have the data. And all I'm advocating here is that maybe it would uh, behoove them to look at it. Uh, so we tried to do that for them just to show you the utility of looking at higher energy. So this is from this paper I wrote a while ago with Joe Romante, Aaron Cruz, and Martin. If you take the existing uh, um, data from various experiments, so here I've, I've taken Lux, Pico, and Crest, and uh, over their nominal energy, nominal energy ranges, and now because it's a three-dimensional space I want to explore, but I don't have three-dimensional paper, I fix the dark matter mass to one TV, okay? Uh, and now I'm plotting as a function of this splitting and the cross-section, and uh, as we'll talk about in a minute, this is where the hexeno cross-section would typically be, uh, this gray line. You can ask, how well are they doing on constraining uh, inelastic dark matter? So you have to lie below these curves, and you see that um, Lux is doing the best at low splitting, but it starts to turn off pretty quickly with the delta because they had this this window they looked in where they didn't look above what was it um, 30 30 kV. Um, Pico, on the other hand, is looking from 10 kV all the way up to an MeV or so because of the nature of the way that it's going to work. So what we did is we said let's imagine that they they took the blinkers off and they looked uh, they elongated the recoil range they looked into in the, in the upper direction. And they didn't see any more events anyway. Where would their bounds go to? And so this is the inelastic frontier plot. Oh wow, yeah, it's really stretched. Um, uh, so here is, uh, so you see that the Lux result now goes all the way out to 350 uh, kV if they were to look from uh, 1 to 500 kV of recoil energy, which they're capable of doing. They just hadn't done at that time. So that's uh, how much better they could do. And you notice that Pico barely changes because it was already looking over a large range. Okay, so that's what we did way back there, when, and thankfully, uh, um, Raphael Lang and his collaborators were paying attention, so, um, oh, that was a joke, it's not very funny. Um, uh, they, uh, later, they updated their paper, uh, and although they didn't do the analysis, they were kind enough to present the data. So this is, again, it's a complicated plot, so let me just lead you through it. Uh, there are, um, two regions, so anything in blue here is in sort of uh, uh, electronic recoils. This is the nuclear recoil band, this lower red thing here. There's a lot of data up here because a lot of this is um, uh, calibration data. Uh, but anything that looks like a um, big black dot is a potential dark matter recoil if the big black dot lies on this red region. You have to extend it by eye yourself. So it has to lie somewhere on like this curve. If, it's, if you see a big black dot, that's a big discovery because we didn't see anything. So they, uh, they have a bunch of blue dots, which are electronic recoil calibration data, but no uh, measurement data in the nuclear recoil band. But you, what the important thing is you notice that these units go way up, right? Previously, all the plots they showed stopped to this black line, and that was what we analyzed get these curves. And then we went ahead and we imagined that they saw nothing and we produced this curve. And then after our paper came out, Raphael uh, uh, updated his paper and showed us that indeed they see nothing. So that was unfortunate. We would have preferred them to see something. But then we were able to analy analyze this data uh, uh, properly. In other words, our assumption that they saw nothing was correct. And indeed, now with their updated paper, the real curve lies almost exactly on the curve we extrapolated ourselves. So now the experiments are aware of this, and they're slowly starting to look not only at their low energy data, but also their high energy data. There are, of course, experimental complications because they have to calibrate the detector over a far greater 
um, range of, of energies, uh, so it requires work on their part, but now they're starting to do it, and they're probing better and better the elastic field. Okay, so that was where we were uh, a few months ago. And then we asked ourselves the question, okay, great, uh, an experiment has paid attention to us, that's awesome, <laughs> our, work, our job here is done. Uh, then we asked ourselves, can we do better? Is there another way of probing these inelastic models? Um, and that was the first half of the talk, so I have to go even quicker now. So stop me now if you have any questions on the first half. If all that made sense, I can carry on. Okay. Um, so what was that, the Higgsino dark matter dotted yeah. line there? Oh, I'm gonna get to that. Yeah. I'm gonna get to it. Okay, so, so this, that's where the third of the three models is Higgsino. So, so we'll get to that in just a second. Um, but that was part of our motivation. Okay, so can we do better? Now, because I'm a model builder, I'm going to build three models for you, but because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to. So let me give you first some big picture about inelastic dark matter. So as we've already said, you need two mass eigenstates, right, a chi-1 and a chi-2. Chi-2 is heavier than chi-1. And we would like that the only interaction between uh, a nucleus and the dark matter is through this off-diagonal type of coupling. Where so some mediator is exchanged, but in the process, you change flavors of dark matter. So that's the type, you need a model that does that. Okay, suppose you have that model, what do you need to worry about? Well, the first thing you need to worry about is, I can put two insertions of this blob, and I immediately go back to uh, elastic scattering, which we know has none of this kinematic uh, thresholding business, right? That's just a normal elastic scatter, which these experiments were built to do, and you can go look at bow energy recoils, and everything is great. The only problem is that it's happening at a loop level, and uh, so you need to calculate whether the predicted rate from your model at the loop level is above or below the current band. So that's something you need to keep in mind. Um, there are these second states around. So you can ask, uh, they exist in the theory. How many of them exist at the present time in nature? So you need to check that if any of them are made in the early universe, they have uh, long since uh, decayed away. Because of course, this process, chi 2 to chi 1, is not kinematically suppressed, right? There's, there's a, it's an exothermic reaction, so it can certainly happen, and it will happen very easily in direct detection. So if there's as many chi twos in the universe as there are chi ones, we should have already seen it, and your model's dead. Uh, so you need to check there are no primordial chi twos left over. You need to check that this lifetime is short. Uh, but of course, you could also be making chi twos just in a collision, right? Because uh, uh, if chi one happens to scatter in the right way, it can make a chi two, and so you need to check. Uh, the rate at which these chi are being produced in, in our halo, and be sure that you haven't produced too many of them to uh, have already been seen in the detection experiments. And then if you're really ambitious in any model you build that has this, you will also make sure that the relic abundance is just right through this thermal story that I started to talk with. So these are the types of hoops a model builder has to jump through when they invent an inelastic model. So I was going to tell you about three different inelastic models, but I don't have time. Uh, so I will just say the words without going through any of the details. You could imagine an inelastic model where the mediator here is the standard model photon, right? So this chi-1 and chi-2, so such an interaction would be something like this. So my amount of fermions that have a dipole operator with the photon, it's a, if you like, a flavor-changing dipole operator. So this process could occur through photon exchange, and then you would, uh, ask yourself all those questions from the previous transparency, you would find that this decay is far, <coughs> so there's none of these chi twos around, and you could ask how well it is constrained uh, through this inelastic frontier approach. So that's one type of model. Then it goes under the name of magnetic inelastic dark matter, uh, first written down by these characters. Um, I don't have time to go through the details. There's another type of model you could imagine, where the mediator being exchanged is not a photon, but really is the dark photon. Uh, or the, the mediator that couples off diagonally, chi 1 and chi 2, is a dark photon, but there is some kinetic mixing in your model that mixes the dark photon with our photon. So the direct detection process happens like this. You know, there's a flavor changing process through dark photon, dark photon mixes with our photon, our photon couples to the nucleus. And uh, then you would find that um, if this mass splitting is too small, if it's below twice the electron mass, then pretty much the only process through which chi 2 can decay is this process, and it's very, very slow, and you're in trouble. You typically have too many chi 2s around in the present day that we should already have seen their direct detection process. Uh, but if you have 
If you play some more model building games, you can get around this band and you can again ask questions. How do you probe this in the inelastic frontier? And you can see that uh, the inelastic, uh, the direct detection experiments can probe this type of model in interesting ways. Okay, so then the question you were asking. So the third model, which is the model I really want to focus on, is a Higgsino model, or Higgsino like model, I should say. So it is an example of just what we need for uh, inelastic garden methods. So the Higgsino, um, in, a, in, a, in a certain technically natural but rather unpleasant limit of Susie, um, the Higgsino is a Dirac fermion, okay? So uh, because there's a new term, so there's two vial spinners coupled together to the new term, they're degenerate, uh, and then, uh, uh, of course, they're not totally degenerate. So um, if you like, from the low energy perspective, if I decouple all the other parts of Susie, I can think of the Higgsino as a Dirac fermion, with some very, very small Majorana masses for the two components in the Dirac fermion. And what that does is splits the two degenerate parts of the Dirac fermion just by a small amount determined by these Majorana masses. And then I get exactly what I want. But I get uh, two states that couple in an off-diagonal way. And now the mediator is the Z boson. Okay, so before, I, the first one was a photon, the second one was a dark photon, now I'm using the Z boson. So it's exactly what I started out this talk with being, uh, a WIMP. Right, it couples through the weak interactions through that goes on exchange. Um, and the way I can arrange for this in SUSE is to take these various uh, Baroque limits of uh, the NSSN. So if I took a limit where uh, the Wino uh, was far heavier than the Bino, which was in turn far heavier than the Xeno new term, then I could end up in this limit. I could end up with a situation where the splitting between the two Higgs states is hundreds of kV, but obviously, like I said, it's a pretty unpleasant limit, but it is, does make logical sense, if not uh, tasteful sense. Um, so that's the type, of, and, and then because all the couplings are totally predicted now, I know what the scattering cross-section will be, and it is that gray line that uh, showed on previous transparency. Um, and now you also see why I picked for that 2D slice of the 3D space, why I picked one TV as the max. Because if you sit down and calculate uh, how, how this process rotated on its side, right, so how this annihilation process now, rather than the scattering process, if I calculate the annihilation process, I can make a prediction using the Boltzmann equation for the amount of dark matter left over when the universe cools, and I end up with this expression, right, that uh, the amount of dark matter is basically scaling as mu squared, uh, in units of TeV, so I get the right answer for about a 1.1 TeV Higgsino. And that's why I picked 1 TeV as my benchmark number earlier. And then because, again, it's, I know exactly what the Z-coupling is, I can make a prediction for this scattering cross-section, right? And it's about 10 to the minus 39 centimeters squared times this velocity suppression due to the splitting. And that's what the gray line was on my previous transparency. Okay, so then the next thing I told you about the, the three or four hoops that any model builder has to jump through with an IDM model. The next thing I have to calculate is the loop-generated elastic scattering cross-section. So there are uh, three different diagrams I can draw at the loop level. There's one with uh, Z exchange, uh, a Z box, a W box, and then this Higgs uh, uh, penguin. Um, and it just so turns out that if you were to naively work out what these, you know, just at the model builder or Twitter level, counting loop factors and weak couplings and things like this, you would predict that the loop level's cross-section is about 10 to the minus 47. It turns out that these three this, these pair of diagrams and this diagram enter with a different sign, and there's a, an accidental cancellation that was first noticed by Zano and company and then calculated in an effective field theory by Hill and Salon. And uh, uh, there's a partial cancellation that takes this already suppressed number down by a further order of magnitude. And in a rather bizarre, um, Coincidence, I guess, unless, unless you have a model to explain this, come see me after, because I'd love to know. Um, if you look at the rate for this loop calculation for a Higgsino, which sits in a doublet, as a function of the Higgs mass, right, you see that the total scattering cross-section has this, this cancellation is almost maximal for Higgs masses around 125 dB, which I don't know what to make of it other than that uh, nature is cruel. Um, so you end up with this very small scattering cross section, so you can evade constraints. And the final thing that I'm actually going to take advantage of in the last 10 minutes to do uh, some phenomenology is the decay rate for the excited Higgsino state. So you can calculate at one loop, 
how the uh, excited Higgs zero decays down to the, to the ground state Higgs zero. It decays in one loop into a photon plus the ground state. You can cal again, because all the couplings are known, it's a straightforward calculation done a long time ago by Harry and company. Uh, and you can calculate this one loop process, and, uh, and you find that it's fast. And so there's none of these chi twos around in the present day, so that's good. Um, and then to put this in sort of maybe slightly more useful units for what I'm about to tell you, you can ask how long does one of these, if I was to ever make an excited state, how long would it propagate for before spontaneously de-exciting? And uh, taking some benchmark numbers, a few hundred kilometers a second for the, for the motion of the particle, a splitting of a few hundred kV and this canonical mass of a TV because I want relative abundance, I get that it moves about 20 kilometers. So a macroscopic distance. Not huge, but nice. So now I'm going to try and find ways to what I call illuminate the inelastic frontier. So I want to go after this inelastic frontier in a different way uh, from before. Rather than going to high energies, now I'm going to try and go to low energies because I'm going to go after this de excitation. And this de excitation is now looking for a few hundred kV photon, which for the types of experiments that can look for photons, that's a low energy photon. So that's why I have to look for it. So what would you like if you wanted to? go after this de-excitation. If you now wedge yourself to a hexeno like model, you have this process, can you use it to your advantage? Um, and it, it rings a few bells. There's these old papers by uh, Peter Graham, the Sajit and company, um, called Luminous Dark Matter, and then some more recent papers by Maxine and company, uh, where they, they, um, they look for dark matter to be in the excited state and then to spontaneously de-excite and look for the photon. And we're going to do something very similar. We're going to imagine that a hexeno scatters inelastically off a heavy nucleus. Right? I, just, I told you earlier that inelastic scatters prefer the heaviest stuff available. Uh, then I'm going to assume that it travels something macroscopic tens to thousands of kilometers. And then it, it de-excites, and it de-excites giving you one energetic photon. So you want to go after this two-step process. And what you would like to do is you'd like to find a lot of heavy stuff out there. Right? And you'd like to find a large experiment, a large volume experiment sensitive to these low energy photons. So there are a bunch of large volume experiments out there um, that could, in principle, look for hundreds of kV photons. So you want to take some combination of mass and threshold and find the best experiment. We concluded that Boroxino was the best experiment. And that the heavy target we would use would be lead. Right? That's one of the heaviest elements out there. And uh, that's good for the, doing the first step, the elastic upscatter. And so that's what we want to do. And then we want to, rather than take some lead underground, we want to take advantage of all the lead that exists in the world already, buried in the ground in various places. And so the process we were imagining is dark matter coming through the Earth, scattering off some lead that's just sitting around in the Earth minding its own business. That causes dark matter to upscatter into the excited state. That goes in, on its merry way for some length of time, and then just so happens to de-excite inside Boroxino. For those of you that know your geography, you've noticed I put boroxino in the wrong hemisphere. But that's OK, because uh, I'm also going to imagine boroxino like experiments placed all over the world, just to see what we can do. Where's most of the lead in A very good question. So most of the lead in the Earth is in uh, either the crust or the core. Turns out, if you trust geologists, which I, I don't know why this is, because to my mind, I would think lead sinks. right? But apparently, lead exists in the core and in the crust and not in between. So that leads to uh, rather freaky phenomena that we're allowed now to talk about. OK, so is the lead in the Earth really more important than if I were to just stack some ridiculously cheap lead bricks right by my experiment? So that's what these guys did. Uh, they, they stacked some lead on one side of their experiment and took advantage of that. But then the length scales you're going after are, are meters. Sure. Uh, now this I mean, you still have the greatest decay probability of the shortest distance, even though it's falling only very slow. Right, 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 right. But you pay a one over lifetime price. So uh, so you you can do that. And, that. and so what we're advocating is to do something similar, but to use the lead that's lying around. But your solid angle price must be comfortable. Great. Yeah, but well, it turns out yeah. that, that uh, uh, you know, all distances are pretty much equally important. Okay. Because your target volume grows with the distance from the detector. But the solid angle of the detector shrinks in exactly the same way. So all shells are equally important up to the lifetime. Okay. So by using the whole Earth, you access to the So that's what uh, this is. So, so 
Uh, in the remaining two minutes, let me try to. Uh, okay, so so the bottom line is that if one wants to calculate the rate, the, the calculation one has to do is more complicated than that, right? You have to integrate over all possible scatter sites in the Earth, then you have to worry about the probability to decay inside the detector. You have to worry about the solid angle issue you just raised. You have to take into account form factors and velocities and all these things. And it, you have to integrate over the velocity distribution as well as over the Earth. So it's very, very complicated, but you have to do it. But you can gain a little bit of intuition by making various simple approximations. Um, if you remember, I said that uh, because uh, inelastic dark matter favors the high velocity tail, the high speed tail of the distribution, you can imagine the first approximation that the, well, the, the place from which all the dark matter is coming with the highest speed is Cygnus, the constellation of Cygnus, which is basically the direction we're moving in our galaxy. We're moving towards Cygnus. And so since we're moving in that direction, the highest speed dark matter is coming from that direction. So let's imagine, uh, so, and this is a basically graphical way of saying that. Cygnus is where this cross is. And you can ask, where does the most of the flux come from as I increase uh, the, the splitting? As the splitting gets larger and larger and larger, the largest flux comes from around the direction of Cygnus. OK, so now you, th that's to say I can now think of dark matter as just being shot at me from, by some aliens that live in uh, Cygnus. And they're shooting dark matter at me. What, what would dark matter see on its way to my underground detector? Well, basically, uh, you can ask, uh, what is the overburden from my detector towards Cygnus at various times of the day? And that's what this plot is showing. So this is 0 to 2 pi as the Earth rotates once in a day. Uh, and I can ask, what does my underground detector placed in Italy, somewhere near Gran Sasso, what does it see? So uh, it sees two kilometers of crust for a long time. And then as you start, as the signal starts to drop below the horizon, you see more and more crust. And then at some point, you actually see a little bit of mantle. And then you come back on the other side, and you're no longer looking through the mantle. And now you can imagine putting an experiment two kilometers underground in the southern hemisphere and ask the same question, what does it see looking towards Cygnus? And it sees the crust. And then some, for a large fraction of the day, it sees a lot of mantle as well as a bit of crust. And they're even capable of looking through the core towards Cygnus, and so on and so forth. So then you combine these plots with those numbers you just asked me about, and you start to get a sense of when you would maximize your rate, because you want to look through the most amount of land for this process to happen. OK, so that's to give you some intuition without having to do the 60 integral. But instead, we just did the 60 integral, because uh, uh, we had access to the computer. And uh, um, as I said, the, uh, the amount of lead the lead overburden depends upon the position of Cygnus, right? And this changes on a sidereal day. Once every 23 hours and 56 minutes, you get back to where you started. And uh, um, because this is not exactly the same as 24 hours, when the peak of the rate happens, changes with season in an interesting way. So there's a very interesting modulation pattern here. That's what I'm trying to get at. That could, in principle, allow you to uh, look in the Borotino data and try to fit uh, this interesting modulation pattern to see if there's anything in their data that fits this predicted uh, distribution of uh, rate. And in fact, if this is at, Bar this is at uh, Barocino. In fact, if you go to the Southern Hemisphere, something even more interesting happens. So you see this is uh, 0 to 24 hours. You get a peak and then minima. Here, in the Southern Hemisphere, you get two peaks because of the fact that Cygnus is um, uh, in the northern hemisphere, and so you look through the crust sort of twice a day in the southern hemisphere, and since the crust is where most of the lead is, uh, it's useful to us. You get this interesting double peak. So anyway, the, the bottom line of this slide is there's very, very uh, unique modulation signatures. You would not expect the background to modulate on a sidereal day, and you certainly wouldn't expect it to modulate twice a day if you happen to have a southern hemisphere experiment. Um, so you can take advantage of this to try to uh, look at Baroxino data and try to see if there's a signal. So we can't do that, obviously, because we're not Baroxino experimentalists. We can do something a little uh, more trivial. So what we did is we went to Baroxino, uh, which for those of you that don't know, like I did six months ago, uh, this is what Baroxino is. It's a, uh, a big uh, lump of scintillator. It's some mineral oil. Uh, it's pretty big. It has you know a lot, a lot of data. They have a threshold that goes down to about 100 and 50 kV or thereabouts. Uh, we're not sure if they can go lower, but they have a background down here. 
Uh, this background is coming from carbon-14 contamination, and the decay of carbon-14 certainly doesn't vary on a sidereal day. So if you had access to timestamps, you should be able to dig under this background. We cannot, uh, but what I want to say is, that although they have a large-ish background, they do understand it very well. These are the residuals once they fit their background. Um, so we can take advantage of this, and we can do our own estimate of the Borotino background. Uh, here it is as a function of energy. This is in cans per day per 100 tons per kV, so basically cans per day per Borotino. <laughs> and you see uh, um, it starts to grow because of this carbon-14 background down here. Um, so what we did is we asked ourselves, we can't really do a time analysis because we don't have access to the time data, but we can do something that's a little better than just trying to beat this background uh, of about five events per day. We can ask, we can sort of use the 12 hours of the day where our signal is minimum, and we can use that to measure the background. In principle, they could do this. And we can use the 12 hours of the day where our signal is maximal, and we could compare the rate in the off period and the on period. And we could use that to try and get a constraint on the amount of uh, signal one could have. And remember, this is the signal looks like this in the background, right? There's a line. Of course, there's a resolution of Borotino because the resolution is not perfect. So we mimicked our signal as just a simple top hat. And then we looked at the amount of background that was in that uh, as we vary delta, right? This top hat moves around. And we compare the signal rate to the background rate. And then we get the scale by the exposure because of this fact that we're doing with the own region to the off. Anyway, cut a long story short, because I ran out of time, I apologize. We can take uh, the same plane that I showed the previous results in. So here again is the Higgsino line. These, this blue and green and red curve are the slide, uh, from the inelastic frontier analysis, the high end recoil analysis I showed you earlier. Uh, and here is what we think Boroxino can do. So Boroxino, just by looking in their data, uh, can go out to far larger deltas. Uh, and start to probe new regions of the inelastic uh, frontier. Um, and down here where it starts to turn off, this is because of this large carbon-14 background kicking in at low uh, recoil. Now if you had a zero background experiment of about one meter cubed, you could start to uh, um, potentially probe this uh, along this dashed line. So this, this kink here is due to the fact that everything down here is actually better served by using iron as a target in the Earth, because there's a lot more iron. And at these low deltas, you can still scatter off iron. Um, and so this is actually probing using the iron distribution. And then this is using a lead distribution up here. Uh, we didn't bother to use the iron for Boroxino, because you see the background starts to grow down there for a real Boroxino. But if you had a zero background experiment, and what matters here is not really whatever fills Boroxino, right? We don't care. Uh, whatever material is in here. We just really care that they're capable of seeing a photon. So you just want a large, low threshold space capable of seeing photons, and then you can do this type of search. For the last so I ran out of time. I apologize uh, uh, for running over. But the, the conclusions are that uh, um, there is this orthogonal direction one can move in dark matter space that still allows for weak scale uh, interactions of dark matter. There are several well-motivated models uh, we're starting to probe this inelastic frontier using direct detection experiments, but there's another interesting signal where we can take advantage of neutrino experiments to probe it um, and look for this de-excitation photon. And uh, you can ask yourself, well, there's a whole host of large volume experiments out there. Uh, are there other, other things one could do with the, these and other neutrino -like experiments? And I'll stop there. Thank you. We'll take one or two pressing questions. So by chance, uh, did you try to explain this auditor type, uh, like a two tau events using this? I did not, no. no. Just wondering, since it's a, yeah, yeah. you can probably, um, I think, in principle. But I would, no, no, but those are very, very high energy, right? Oh, no, the photons, I, I guess they see are not high energy. Yeah, so, so. That's right. They, they infer neutrino energy as well. Exactly. But not the but photons. Not people you're like, I'm oh, sorry, seriously. No, 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 I was right there, what are you? Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. Uh, I had a